Lord of the Flies, Chapter 8, Gift of the Darkness, page 132. Simon had passed through the area of fruit trees, but today the little ones had been too busy with the fire on the beach, and they had not pursued him there. He went on among the creepers until he reached a great mat that was woven by the open space and crawled inside. Beyond the screens of leaves, the sunlight pelted down and the butterflies danced in the middle of their unending dance. He knelt down and the arrow of sun fell on him. That other time the air had seemed to vibrate with heat, but now it threatened. Soon the sweat was running from his long coarse hair. He shifted restlessly, but there was no avoiding the sun. Presently he was thirsty, and then very thirsty. He continued to sit. Far off along the beach, Jack was standing before a small group of boys. He was looking brilliantly happy. Hunting, he said. He sized them up. Each of them wore the remains of a black cap, and ages ago they had stood in two junior rows, and their voices had been the song of angels. We'll hunt. I'm going to be chief. They nodded, and the crisis passed easily. And then, about the beast. They moved, looking at the forest. I say this. We aren't going to bother about the beast. He nodded at them. We're going to forget the beast. That's right. Yes, forget the beast. If Jack was astonished by their fervor, he did not show it. And another thing. We shan't dream so much down here. This is near the end of the island. They agreed passionately out of the depths of their tormented private lives. Now listen, we might go later to the castle rock, but now I'm going to get more of the biggins away from the conch and all that. We'll kill a pig and give a feast. He paused and went on more slowly. And about the beast. When we kill, we'll leave some of the kill for it. Then it won't bother us, maybe. He stood up abruptly. We'll go into the forest now and hunt. He turned and trotted away, and after a moment they followed him obediently. They spread out nervously in the forest. Almost at once Jack found the dung and scattered roots that told a pig, and soon the track was fresh. Jack signaled the rest of the hunt to be quiet and went forward by himself. He was happy and wore the damp darkness of the forest, like his old clothes. He crept down the slope to rocks and scattered trees by the sea. The pigs lay bloated bags of fat, sensuously enjoying the shadows under the trees. There was no wind, and they were unsuspicious, and practice had made Jack silent as the shadows. He stole away again and instructed his hidden hunters. Presently they all began to inch forward, sweating in the silence and heat. Under the trees, an ear flapped idly. A little apart from the rest, sunk in deep material, maternal bliss, lay the largest sow of the lot. She was black and pink, and the great bladder of her belly was fringed with a row of piglets that slept or burrowed and squeaked. Fifteen yards from the drove, Jack stopped, and his arm straightening, pointed at the sow. He looked round in inquiry to make sure that everyone understood, and the other boys nodded at him. The row of right arms slid back. Now! The drove of pigs started up, and at a range of only ten yards, the wooden spears with fire-hardened points flew toward the chosen pig. One piglet, with a demented shriek, rushed into the sea, trailing Roger's spear behind it. The sow gave a gasping squeal and staggered up, with two spears sticking in her fat flank. The boys shouted and rushed forward. The piglets scattered, and the sow burst the advancing line and went crashing away through the forest. After her, they raced along the pig track, but the forest was too dark and tangled, so that Jack, cursing, stopped them and cast among the trees. Then he said nothing for a time but brief fierceness that they were awed by him, and looked at each other in an uneasy admiration. Presently... He stabbed down at the ground with his finger. There. Before the others could examine the drop of blood, Jack had swerved off, judging a trace, touching a bough that gave. So he followed mysteriously right and assured, and the hunters trod behind him. He stopped before a covert. In there. They surrounded the covert, but the sow got away with the sting of another spear in her flank. The trailing butts hindered her, and the sharp cross-cut points were a torment. She blundered into a tree, forcing a spear still deeper, and after that any of the hunters could follow her easily by the drops of vivid blood. The afternoon wore on, hazy and dreadful with damp heat. The sow staggered her way ahead of them, bleeding and mad, and the hunters followed, wedded to her in lust, excited by the long chase and the dropped blood. They could see her now, nearly got up with her, but she spurted with her last strength and held ahead of them again. They were just behind her when she staggered into an open space where bright flowers grew and butterflies danced round each other and the air was hot and still. Here, struck down by the heat, the sow fell and the hunters hurtled themselves at her. This dreadful eruption from an unknown world made her frantic. 
She squealed and bucked, and the air was full of sweat and noise and blood and terror. Roger ran round the heap, prodding with the spear whenever pig flesh appeared. Jack was on top of the sow, stabbing downward with his knife. Roger found the lodgment at first point and began to push till he was leaning with his whole weight. The spear moved forward inch by inch, and the terrified squealing became a high-pitched scream. Then Jack found the throat, and the hot blood spouted over his hands. The sow collapsed under them, and they were heavy and fulfilled upon her. The butterfly still danced, preoccupied in the center of the clearing. At last, the immediacy of the kill subsided. The boys drew back, and Jack stood up, holding out his hands. Look! He giggled and flicked them while the boys laughed at his reeking palms. Then Jack grabbed Maurice and rubbed his stuff over his cheeks. Roger began to withdraw his spear, and boys noticed it for the first time. Robert stabilized the thing in a phrase which was received uproariously. Right up her ass! Did you hear? Did you hear what he said? Right up her ass! This time, Robert and Maurice acted the two parts, and Maurice's acting of the pig's effort to avoid the advancing spear was so funny that the boys cried with laughter. At length, even this palled. Jack began to clean his bloody hands on the rock. Then he started to work on the sow and paunched her, lugging out the hot bags of colored guts, pushing them into a pile on the rock while the others watched him. He talked as he worked. We'll take the meat along the beach. I'll go back to the platform and invite them to a feast. That should give us time. Roger spoke. Chief? Uh, how could we make a fire? Jack squatted back and frowned at the pig. We'll raid them and take fire. There must be four of you. Henry and you, Robert and Maurice, we'll put on paint and sneak up. Roberter, can you snatch a branch while I say what, what I want? The rest of you can get this back to where we were. We'll build a fire there. And after that, he paused and stood up looking at the shadows under the trees. His voice was lower when he spoke again. But we'll leave part of the kill for... He knelt down again and was busy with his knife. The boys crowded round him. He spoke over his shoulder to Roger. Sharpen a stick at both ends. Presently he stood up, holding the dripping sow's head in his hands. Where's the stick? Here. Ram one end in the earth. Oh, it's rock. Jam it in that crack. There. Jack held up the head and jammed the soft throat down on the pointed end of the stick, which pierced through into its mouth. He stood back, and the head hung there, a little blood dribbling down the stick. Instinctively, the boys drew back, too, and the forest was very still. They listened, and the loudest noise was the buzzing of flies over the spilled guts. Jack spoke in a whisper. Pick up the pig. Maurice and Robert skewered the carcass, lifted the dead weight, and stood ready. In the silence and standing over the dry blood, they looked suddenly furtive. Jack spoke loudly. This head is for the beast. It's a gift. The silence accepted the gift and awed them. The head remained there, dim-eyed, grinning faintly, blood blackening between the teeth. All at once, they were running away as fast as they could, through the forest toward the open beach. Simon stared where he was, a small brown image concealed by the leaves. Even if he shut his eyes, the sow's head still remained like an after-image. The half-shut eyes were dim with the infinite cynicism of adult life. They assured Simon that everything was a bad business. I know that. Simon discovered that he'd spoken aloud. He opened his eyes quickly, and there was the head grinning amusedly in the strange daylight, ignoring the flies, the spilled guts, even ignoring the indignity of being spiked on a stick. He looked away, licking his dry lips. A gift for the beast. Might not the beast come for him? The head, he thought, appeared to agree with him. Run away, said the head silently. Go back to the others. It was a joke, really. Why should you bother? You were just wrong, that's all. A little headache. Something you ate, perhaps. Go back, child, said the head silently. Simon looked up, feeling the weight of his wet hair, and gazed at the sky. Up there, for once, were clouds, great bulging towers that sprouted away over the island, gray and cream and copper-colored. The clouds were sitting on the land. They squeezed, produced moment by moment, this close tormenting heat. Even the butterflies deserted the open space where the obscene thing grinned and dripped. Simon lowered his head carefully, keeping his eyes shut, then sheltered them with his hand. There were no shadows under the trees, but everywhere a pearly stillness, so that what was real seemed elusive and without definition. The pile of guts was a black blob of flies that buzzed like a saw. After a while, these flies found Simon. Gorged, they alighted by his runnels of sweat and drink. They tickled under his nostrils and played leapfrog on his thighs. They were black and iridescent green and without number and in front of Simon 
the lord of the flies hung on his stick and grinned at last simon gave up and looked back saw the white teeth and dim eyes the blood and his gaze was held by that ancient inescapable recognition in simon's right temple a pulse began to beat on the brain ralph and piggy lay in the sand gazing at the fire and idly flicking pebbles into its smokeless heart that branch is gone where's sam and eric we ought to get some more wood we're out of green branches ralph sighed and stood up there were no shadows under the palms on the platform only the strange light and seemed to come from everywhere at once high among the bulging clouds thunder went off like a gun we're going to get buckets of rain what about the fire ralph trotted into the forest and returned with a wide spray of green which he dumped on the fire the branch crackled the leaves curled and the yellow smoke expanded piggy made an aimless little pattern in the sand with his fingers trouble is we haven't got enough people for a fire you got to treat sam and eric as one turn they do everything together of course well that isn't fair don't you see they ought to do two turns ralph considered this and understood he was vexed to find out how little he thought like a grown-up inside again the island was getting worse and worse piggy looked at the fire you'll want another green branch soon ralph rolled over piggy what are we going to do just have to get on without him but the fire he frowned at the black and white mess in which lay the unburnt ends of branches he tried to formulate i'm scared he saw piggy look up and blundered on not of the beast i mean i'm scared of that too but nobody else understands about the fire if somebody threw you a rope when you were drowning if a doctor said take this because if you don't take it you'll die you would wouldn't you i mean of course i would can't they see can't they understand without the smoke signal we'll die here look at that a wave of heat trembled above the ashes but without a trace of smoke we can't keep one fire going and they don't care and what's more he looked intensely into piggy's streaming face what's more i don't sometimes supposing i got like the others not caring what'd become of us piggy took off his glasses deeply troubled i don't know ralph we just got to go on that's all that's what grown-ups would do ralph having begun the business of inverting himself continued piggy what's wrong piggy looked at him in astonishment do you mean that no not it i mean what makes things break up like they do piggy rubbed his glasses slowly and thought when he understood how far ralph had gone toward accepting him he flushed pinkly with pride i don't know ralph i expect it's him jack jack a taboo was evolving around that word too ralph nodded solemnly yes he said i suppose it must be the forest near them burst into uproar demonic figures with faces of white and red and green rushed out howling so the little ones fled screaming out of the corner of his eye ralph saw piggy running two figures rushed at the fire and he prepared to defend himself but they grabbed half-burnt branches and raced away along the beach the three others stood still watching ralph and he saw the tallest of them stark naked save for paint and a belt was jack ralph had his breath and spoke well jack ignored him lifted his spear and began to shout listen all of you me and my hunters were living along the beach by a flat rock we hunt and feast and have fun if you want to join my tribe come and see us perhaps i'll let you join perhaps not he paused and looked round he was safe from shame or self-consciousness behind the mask of his paint and could look at each of them in turn ralph was kneeling by the remains of the fire like a sprinter at his mark and his face was half hidden by hair and smut sam and eric peered together round his palm tree the edge of the forest a little and howled creased and crimson by the bathing pool and piggy stood on the platform the white conch gripped in his hands Tonight we're having a feast. We've killed a pig and we've got meat. You can come and eat with us if you like. Up in the cloud canyons, the thunder boomed again. Jack and the two anonymous savages with him swayed, looking up and then recovered. The little one went on howling. Jack was waiting for something. He whispered urgently to the others, Go on, now! The two savages murmured. Jack spoke sharply, Go on! The two savages looked at each other, raised their spears, together and spoke in time the chief has spoken then the three of them turned and trotted away presently ralph rose to his feet looking at the place where the savages had vanished sam and eric came talking in an odd whisper i thought it was and i was scared piggy stood above them at the platform still holding the conch that was jack and maurice and robert said ralph aren't they having fun i thought i was going to have asthma sucks to your asthma 
When I saw Jack, I was sure he'd go for the conch. Can't think why. 